here. back okay just one more slice mm -hmm. They're saying they think it should even go a little bit more. Yeah, that's good. It makes it all the more interesting. That's what I thought. Okay. The shoulder right. is okay. going to go Okay, yeah. great. Great. There are, there are a hundred things I can change. <laughs> it's the first one I've done, and I've learned a lot doing it, but the next one will be no. But it, I, at least I was worried I was going to be embarrassed about it. I don't know. Carolina, I was like, what is that for? <laughs> Reed was like, you need to, let's just go on ahead now. Time. I had to do the dog 
and there was an exact replica of my mother's dog sitting in the park with two girls. <laughs> and, and the way it gets better. <laughs> so I, I got running outside and, uh, and uh, run over the girls and say, I got to go to the dog. Now you, your dog's just what I've been looking for, and you have two young girls. And they just graduated from the Institute, and here I am running out to them in this house. Who's yeah. this guy? <laughs> what's, he real, what's his real game? You know? And fortunately, my son was inside the house, uh, Louis. He was down in New York. And I called him out. I said, Louis, doesn't this dog look exactly like the dog in the photograph? And he gave me some support and acknowledgement. And they began to warm up a little bit. And they actually gave me their email and said I could email them about using the dog as a model. And uh, so they said, well, you know, it's strange because this is a rescue animal. And uh, usually with men, he's particularly reticent. But the dog come running up to me the moment really? I walked outside and was jumping all over me the whole time we were talking. So I turned to the girl. I said, well, what's the dog's name? And she said, Lottie. And my mouth dropped open because that was the name of my mother's dog. Really? <laughs> oh, <that's right. laughs> Welcome to historic Oliver's Carriage House, the home of Kittimacundi Community Church. And welcome to the dedication of our new sacred garden. My name is Don Benson, I'm president of the Church Council. 
Thank you all for coming on this glorious late June afternoon. We especially want to thank the extended family of Libby Rouse for being here today to help us celebrate this very special occasion. I know that she's here with us, and I hope she's pleased at what has been created out here in what was once just a big backyard. As you can see, construction of the Sacred Garden is not quite finished. There's still a bit more work to do on the pathway from the arch, and there's grass to be watered and sprouted. Plus, we've got more trees coming in the fall when planting conditions are more suitable. In fact, we've got more trees coming tomorrow. <laughs> but I think it's most appropriate that we've all gathered here today to celebrate because it was almost, it was 40 years ago, almost to this day, <laughs> that the members of this church who had been meeting across the street in what was then called Oakland Manor held a processional to this place, their new home, Oliver's Carriage House. Just a few years before that, Kittimacundi Community Church was born. Born of a call held by a woman whose longing for community was a driving force in her life. That woman was Elizabeth Libby Winstead Rouse, whom we honor today. Libby Rouse and her husband Jim were attending the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C. Years later, she came here and spoke and told us that something kept gnawing at her in those days. We've got to have an ecumenical coffee house church in Columbia, she said. Gordon Cosby, who was the spiritual leader of Church of the Savior, told her, Libby, you must be the sounder of that call. She said, nobody talks like that anymore. <laughs> but Gordon talked like that. So together with her husband, Jim Rouse, and five others, Jane Mason, Neil and Normie Harris, and John and Dee Dee Levering, they gathered for church. First in the Levering's home, then at King's Contrivance Restaurant, as others began to worship with them, then at Oakland Manor, and then finally here at this beautiful carriage house. Libby told us the Holy Spirit was truly with us. And today, nearly five decades later, we at KC believe the Holy Spirit is still with us as we live out Libby's call for an ecumenical Christian church that welcomes everybody. I'd like now to invite to the podium Barbara Lawson, one of our longtime KC members and someone who has been instrumental in helping to make this garden a reality. Barbara will introduce one of our very special guests. It is absolutely thrilling to look out at everybody today. I have so many friends that I've known for the last 37 years that are in this crowd. Um, but I need to tell a little story before I introduce Jimmy Rouse. And my story starts in this building 37 years ago when I met Jane Mason. And um, Betsy, uh, Mason, or Betsy Mason is here today with us along with Timmy. And your mother was so special to me. Um, and Betsy, or, uh, Jane used to tell me stories about Libby. They grew up, they were uh, childhood friends, and so they had a lifelong friendship. And this morning when I was walking around Wild Lake, I was thinking about the fact that um, a picture of Libby as a child is what was the inspiration for Jimmy's um, sculpture. And I started thinking about Jane and Libby as two little girls holding hands. And I became aware that we probably have two sprites with us today, tucked over there, grinning from ear to ear as friends. And so I hope you will kind of go with that little trip with me too and think that they're both here enjoying this. So when I got to know Jane, she would talk to me about her friendship with Libby. And both of them um, really valued community and did all they could to promote community. But Jane's pain was around the fact that Libby had not gotten her full due in terms of recognition, in terms of her participation in the uh, creation of Columbia and our church. And over the years, that has stayed with me. And people that are close to me know that from time to time, I'll bring it up, that it concerns me that oftentimes women are not a part of our history and are somehow written out. 
And so part of the spirit for me is how stories work. I've been carrying this story for 30 some years. And two years ago, Pat and Ellen Kennedy and I had an opportunity to take a little side trip. And Pat asked me, well, what have you been doing lately? And I said, oh, Pat, there's something that we're doing at our church. Elaine Booter is heading this up. And we've started a sacred garden, which the first part of it is right over here. And I said, I'm very excited, but we don't have the money to do the next two, two stages of it. And, um, but that'll happen, that'll happen. Within two weeks, Pat called and said that he had received a call from Jimmy Rouse that um, in Libby's will, $75,000 had been left to do something to memorialize her and to cause a remembrance of her contribution to community in Columbia. And Pat said, I'm wondering if it would fit in your garden plans. I wonder if there's any way that this might work. So he set up a time for Jimmy and I to meet. We met in his studio in his house, and he laid out two history books, both of which he had uh, put those little markers in there showing that Libby had been the founder of this building and this church community and a part of, of community, the broader community. And after we talked about that a little bit, we came over here and we walked around and we looked and we dreamed about what could be the possibilities here. And believe me, we had not even <laughs> thought very far at that point. Um, but it was the beginning of those conversations. And so for the last two years, I've had really the deep, deep honor to work with Jimmy Rouse. I have never worked with anybody that had less ego, that, that was so easy to work with. From the moment he had the inspiration of what the, the sculpture should look like, he was ready to move with it. Um, some of you may know that he graduated from Yale and poli sci, but his passion is art. He's been a visual artist for years and years, um, taking courses at MICA. Six years ago, he started studying sculpture at MICA. Um, and before that, he had a stand as an entrepreneur. Many of you probably have eaten at uh, Louis Bookstore and Cafe in Baltimore. That was a part of, of his past and history. But in two years, we've bonded and had so many good stories and sharings together. And I can't b believe that we're now here um, at the culmination of this project. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Jimmy, who I consider now a dear friend, and have him say a few words about this book. So thank you, Barbara, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for coming to this event. Um, I want to back up and give you a little story of how this all came about. Um, it started when we read my mother's will, and there was, as Barbara mentioned, $75,000 left in the will to create a memorial for her in Columbia. And as it worked out, um, my mother and father were together uh, at the beginning of Columbia, but a couple of years later they ended up getting a divorce. And my father remarried a year later, and my mother felt shut out from Columbia uh, after he had remarried and he was living here. And so she, the, the relationship between my mother and father, which started on their very first date, centered around the idea of community. She told me that their first date, they went down to Baltimore Harbor and they sat and talked about what would make a better city? How could we make Baltimore better? And so that was so much of a part of their being and their dialogue all through their marriage. And then, you know, right when Columbia, which was the fruition of all of that began, my mother felt shut out and she harbored uh, a desire to be recognized for her role in all the conversations she had had with my father, which had led him to go beyond shopping centers to planning a whole community. She was so much a part of giving him those ideas and motivation. And so of course, she, just naturally, she wanted some recognition for it. And so that was the beginning point. The, the will, the $75,000 in the will, and none of us knew quite what to do about it. And so 
I said I would look into it. I had no idea what to do at the time, and I called Pat, and uh, he put me together with Barbara. And at about that same time, my mother died in 2010. Uh, we were going through our house, which she'd lived in since the early 50s, and I came across this photograph of my mother as a child, a 10-year-old child. It was taken in 1924 with her dog. And it was, a, it was a beautiful, sepia, large photograph of her. And when I saw that photograph, this dedication just popped into my head, saying, dedicated to Libby Rouse, his longing for community as a child, led to many of the ideas that became incorporated into Columbia. And community building, she, she used to tell me when she had trouble sleeping, in her teenage years, she would invent this whole fantasy about a rabbit community and who was mayor and how the community would work. I mean, community was so much a part of her life and, and her parents had a very Victorian and, and distant marriage and she felt such a drive for bringing people together, relationships and community became her whole focus. So. I saw that picture, I thought of that dedication. I'd been taking sculpture for a few years at the Institute and I'd just done a, a, my first life-size piece and I thought, well, you know, I could do that. I, I could make that two-dimensional picture, three dimensions, and that could be the memorial to my mother. And so that's how this process began. And it, it was so synchronistic from the very beginning I'm not really a religious person, although I am spiritual, but it is hard to look at this process and not realize somebody's hand was like <laughs> guiding it. And the first thing was calling Pat, then meeting Barbara, who knew about my mother through Jane Mason, and then making the sculpture. And, and there was, even down to the last day when we installed it, when, when David Dowles and I had talked about installing it, we talked about building a rectangular uh, base footing that has to go three feet in the ground and putting the sculpture on that. But when I arrived here on Wednesday to install it, there, there wasn't a, re a, a rectangle base, it was a circle. And I was saying, why do we have a circle? We, we talked about a rectangle. And, and um, the rectangle was going to be facing, you know, out towards the other side of the pond. And so the first thought was, will the sculpture even fit within that circle? And so the, the foundry that was installed had a template, we put it on the circle and it, fit, it just fit onto the, in, within that circle. And then we went to put the sculpture in the place that it was going to go, and immediately we realized it needs to be turned. It, her eyes were looking to the side because originally I had planned for her to be, for the sculpture to be beside a path and you'd be walking up it and she'd be kind of turned to meet you. But now with the pond in place, I, if, if the sculpture would be facing you directly across the pond, her eyes would have been to the side. So because it was a circle, we were able to turn it, and now our eyes face you. I mean, so much has happened. <laughs> but there's one story that tops them all, and that's when I was going to do this. I'd never done an animal before or a dog before, and all I had was this photograph of this dog that was just one angle, and the dog was kind of a mutt, and it had long hair, like hair that long, and I could only see it from one angle, so I had no idea what was going on in the back side of the dog and the tail. And so I kept looking for dogs that would be a model for me. And, and I looked and I looked and it was getting, in order to get this sculpture cast and ready for the spring, it takes four months to cast a piece like that. So I had to have it finished by December. This was getting to be the fall and it was crunch time. I had to do this dog. And I was in my Bolton Hill studio one day and looking out, it overlooks a park, and I look out the window and there sitting in the park is a dog that's a perfect replica of my mother's dog. So I go running outside and, and there are two girls who had just graduated from the Institute, young girls, who were sitting there with the dog and I said, 
I, I, I gotta use your dog, I gotta use your dog as a model, you know, and, and I could tell that they were like pulling back, <laughs> who is this man, you know, <laughs> and what's he trying to get, you know, <laughs> so um, fortunately my son Louie was inside, and I called him out and I said, Louie, doesn't this dog look just like the dog in the photograph? And he backed me up. And, and the girls began to warm up a little bit and say, they gave me their email and said, so email them and they would see that if, I, I said, I need to take pictures and I, I need to be able to call on you and come visit the dog when I get stuck, you know? <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> They, they agreed, and, and um, then the, one of the girls turned to me and said, well, you know, it's funny. This is a rescue animal, and it's usually very reticent around males. Well, this dog had come running right up to me from the moment I walked out of my house and was jumping all over me the whole time. So I, I turned to the girls, and I said, well, what, what's the dog's name? And they said, it's Lottie. Well, Lottie was the name of my mother's dog. Oh. <laughs> so, there's some hand involved, <laughs> I don't know who it is, but um, probably my mother's, given, given, given her determination. So I looked at this photograph, I stared at this photograph for months, doing first a 12 inch version, then a half size, and then the full size. And I began to see in my mother's expression as a child a certain impishness and determination that I wanted so much to get in that sculpture, I hope I succeeded. But um, that was so much a part of my mother and it became so appropriate for that photograph as a representation of my mother's spirit. So I'm really happy that I chose that as the motif. And, and um, besides honoring my mother, there are kind of two other sub-messages that the sculpture represents to me. And one is what Barbara alluded to briefly was the perennial uh, lack of recognition of the role of womankind in the history of mankind. So I hope the sculpture does something to correct that, at least in terms of Columbia because my mother's role was essential and important. And, and the other meaning it has to me was, in my lifetime, I, I noticed that young girls, young boys too, but particularly young girls, before they reach puberty, before the human hormones kick in, seem to have a very lucid, clear vision of society and what humanity needs. And I felt that it was so appropriate to portray my mother as a young girl because I want to honor young girls and their vision and the statues kind of a, a symbol to them that your dreams and your vision can actually be manifested into reality. So I want that to be part of this message from the sculpture. And, and um, well, it's, it's been such a pleasure working with Barbara. And I thank you all for coming, and I hope this communicates what I see the sculpture is being about. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Elaine Booter, who has shepherded the Sacred Garden Project from its very beginning, and she will introduce another of our special guests. Nelson Mandela. Can you all hear me? Because this microphone is very high. Okay. Uh, Nelson Mandela once said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's how we felt about this garden, that it might not happen, but I think it is going to happen. So <laughs> it's almost done. When I was five years old, my father read the book, The Secret Garden, to me. Ever since then, I've loved gardens. In 2007, a group of folks here at the Kittick Montgomery Community Church formed what they called a visioning committee, or a group. One of the things they imagined was to transform the empty half-acre 
of land that was sitting back here into a spiritual garden. Casey has always been a call-based church, and I felt the call to bring life to this idea of having us be co-creators with God to make this space an outdoor church. So I put out a call to the church community asking for help, and from that moment on, many, many people have taken up the call to offering their talents and money to create more than I could ever have imagined. It's become a creative dance with God. Two of the many people who had a huge impact on this process at the beginning are the late Bob Cummings, who dreamed this dream with me right from the beginning, and Joe Brunetti, who created the first concept drawing and designed the first phase, a memorial garden, which is over there. And it's a garden, a memorial garden, because it, that is where members of KC can be buried as a, in their ashes. And then there was Barbara Lawson, who did grant writing, creative fundraising, budgeting, public relations, and brought us Jimmy Rouse, who was looking for a place to honor his mother living. The committee grew to include the talents of Carol Dunleavy, Carol O'Bell, Pat Engelbach, and Mary Jean Sasser, and there's so many more people who've helped too. Too many to name, because I know I'll forget a few. There was an anonymous donor who get, got us moving forward when we were stuck in a financial quagmire. Thanks so much to every one of you who gave money and time to help build this garden. Many of the donations made are in memory of loved ones who have passed away. Many of these donations, huge amount, and I believe there were loads of happy souls floating around this garden during its construction and now as we dedicate it. We extend our deepest appreciation to the talented design, construction, and landscape crew from European Landscape and Designs who gave us way more than what we asked for. It's more beautiful than anyone thought it could be, and as Don said, we aren't done yet. The vision of this garden still has many features to be completed in subsequent phases. For example, we look forward to have adding a meditative labyrinth that will be open to everyone in the church, in the community, and beyond. The garden will be available for rental events like weddings. The wooden pergola and patio circle over there that you see behind me is designed for weddings, and the labyrinth, when it's installed, will provide a hard surface for chairs that will seat the guests at these events. Because we have more to build, we hope that you will consider giving a gift to the garden in honor of someone or in memory of a loved one. In the room where refreshments will be served after this program is a display showing the trees and benches that have been adopted as a memorial gifts, and there are many more still available. One other special thanks to the landscape architect who designed the second phase of our garden. David Dows of AB Consulting Company. He has poured his heart and soul into this project, and even though his work is technically done, he's still with us, and even now is visioning future landscapes. Dave, will you please come to the podium and tell us about your experience? Nice to see you all. Um, what Jimmy Rouse doesn't know is that um, I tried at the last moment to make that pedestal rectangular. <laughs> but the drawings didn't get to the contractor in time. And not only that, Jimmy, I didn't even, well, I failed to put a dimension of it on the drawings. <laughs> And somehow it got done. Uh, it, those are facts. Um, the church asked me to help them design a garden for the spirit. A garden for meditation, a garden for reflection. But they also asked me to help them design a garden for gathering, celebration. And what you see here is the almost completion of the second phase of the construction of this garden. Mostly, the intent of the second phase was to get the infrastructure in. 
uh, that is the hardscape elements, the pergola, the pond, the walkways. And there are future phases to follow. And you can begin to see the structure of the design of the garden here. Uh, the creation of the larger spaces and the beginnings of the articulation of those spaces. And in the future, smaller and more in, um, intimate spaces will be created um, by new plantings. And basically, these are going to be to the outside, for example, where you are, of this walkway. And um, they'll be created mostly by plantings. Um, many landscape architects don't get a chance anymore to do the kind of work that returns them to the origin of their profession, designing gardens. Um, especially not one of this scale and scope. And so I am very grateful to have been given this opportunity. I want to express that gratitude and my thanks to a number of people, the people of this church first, and the garden committee that guided me and helped me um, uh, to this design, especially Barbara Lawson, um, who did the budgeting and kept me in bounds, <laughs> and especially, especially to Elaine Duder and her leadership. Um, I have a couple of colleagues here that I want to give a shout out to. Uh, one of them is right over here, Bob Boyd, a landscape architect who helped me. Um, and Christine Gillette, another landscape architect in my office. Both of them were instrumental in helping create this design. And there was another fellow named Steve Heiss who couldn't be here today. He's the uh, civil engineer that helped us with the drainage and the, you know, the, the things the civil engineers did. <laughs> um, and he was especially helpful to us. Um, I want to give a shout out to European Landscapes. I think they've done a very good job here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michelle Maust and the, um, the, um, the site supervisor, a man named Chandra. I want to thank Maureen Nicholas. She's here, I haven't seen her, but she introduced me to the church and the landscape committee. And I also want to say a kind word about uh, Chad Edmonds, who uh, works at uh, Howard County's DPZ and really helped us uh, get this garden uh, where it should be in the, uh, in the development review process. So, all of these people were instrumental, and I must say they all held had a very positive attitude and were inspirational to me, and they kept the faith in me as we went along. Sometimes that wasn't so easy to do. Um, I want to invite everybody here to return to the garden, uh, to return to this garden, maybe make it a habit of coming here at least once a season. The seasonal change is going to be part of the design to emphasize that. And watch it change and watch it grow and watch it mature. We're a long way from being done. But uh, for the second phase, anyway, as Barbara Lawson just said to me a moment ago, we did it. So thank you all very much. Before we get to the garden blessing, every program has a commercial, so just a small commercial. <laughs> Repeating what Elaine said, if you haven't had a chance to donate to the Sacred Garden and you'd like to, we're going to be having refreshments in the right behind you in the center room on the lower level. And there are envelopes there. There is a, a board that has a layout of the garden, tells you which trees are designated in memory or in honor of people, and feel free to do that if you'd like. 
And now I'd like to introduce our enabling minister here at Kittimacundi Community, Reverend Heather Kirk Davidoff, for the blessing of the garden. Well, let me add my thanks to each of you for being here and for the amazing, amazing team that um, put this put this together, made this dream, this vision a reality. In 2011, we dedicated the first phase of this garden. This is, this is an ongoing project with this beautiful addition being one, one part of a multi-phase project. The first phase was, as uh, Elaine mentioned, the memorial garden over there um, that was designed as a, a place where members and friends can have their ashes buried, a place where we'll gather to remember people. How wonderful that that path that leads us to that place of remembering leads around to a place designed for celebration and then passes by that, that wonderful statue, that wonderful image of, as you put it, impishness and determination and longing. Longing that, that this journey, memory, celebration, discovery, is one that we make not just alone, but that we make together, that we walk that, that path together. When we had that, um, when we first completed that um, memorial garden in 2011, a poet wrote a prayer of um, blessing for us, a, a poem of blessing, a poet named uh, Marin Tirabasi. And um, I'd like to offer a slightly amended version of that um, prayer that she wrote for us um, as a prayer of dedication for this um, next phase of the garden. So let's join our hearts together. God, we need peace, and so we come to the garden for quiet. We need joy, and so we come to the garden for our senses. The green of leaf, the rich crumbling smell of soil, and the fresh smell of pine and rose, the sounds of squirrels and birds, the gentle gurgle and splash of water, the rough texture of rocks, the delicacy of a flower petal. God, we need to let things go. And so we come to this garden to rest and to remember the people who have shaped us and loved us, their stories told, their stories untold. We need places where we can exhale and to breathe in again. God, we need hope, and so we come to this garden to watch things grow, reminding ourselves to be planters and to enjoy what others have planted. We need places for celebration, spaces where sacred promises can be proclaimed, spaces where we can open our hearts to each other, we need benches where we can begin to let Sabbath into our lives, paths that help us recognize our own journeys. We need, God, a justice commitment to environment, a global commitment that calls us to action, but we also need a small square of real earth to root our speeches, to get our hands dirty. God, we need community. And so we come to this garden to give and receive a shared blessing from the hand of the sower of seeds. Bless our garden, Lord. May it be a place for release and remembrance, a place for embrace, a just place and a place to just be. May we meet our neighbors here. May we meet ourselves here. May we meet you here. And let the people say, Amen. Go in peace, friends. Please stay and enjoy uh, the space. Take a closer look at that statue if you haven't yet. See if you see that expression that Jim, Jimmy told us about. And stay for refreshments. You are welcome. Is there a